All right, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Marlena Lester. I'm the Director of Advising here within the College of Engineering, and we would like to welcome you to Explore Engineering Week. Explore Engineering Week is a great way for you to learn about all of the degree programs within the College of Engineering. And so over the next four evenings, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week, we will have departments come and share information about their department. So to get us started tonight, though, I do have a few housekeeping things that I want to share with you, but let me first make sure I get everything off my screen and make sure all the presentation details are showing appropriately. Beautiful. So if you do have your cell phone with you, including myself, I will make sure that we turn it off and that way we don't get it interrupted during the session tonight. And if you have your laptop, just kind of try to refrain from using it unless you're taking notes for the presentation tonight. If you are here for the Engineering 1215 and 1414 class assignment, um, as a reminder, you are required to attend two of the four evenings. And at the end of the evening tonight, after we do the question and answer session, you will have a QR code here on the screen that you will um, scan with your phone and you'll be able to do a quick survey proving that you were here tonight for your attendance for the class assignment. Then what we will do is share that information at the end of Explore Engineering Week with your instructors of the Foundations of Engineering courses. Today you would have all received an email from me as well with details about major exploration resources to help you learn more about the disciplines within our college. And one of the new resources that we also have is a Minecraft Museum for Engineering. This was developed by our faculty in engineering education along with students within the College of Engineering. So if you are into Minecraft and you want to explore the Minecraft environment, feel free to, uh, you can check your email from this morning, but you can also scan this QR code. If for some reason it doesn't work, just let me know. In the email you received this morning, it also had all of these resources. So it had a link to Explore Engineering Week, which is all of these sessions. It had details about our Explore Engineering website, how to explore majors, engineering majors at a glance, which gives you a quick snapshot of all of our disciplines, and also some engineering career resources. Tonight, though, many of the departments are going to share some of that information with you um, about their particular programs. So to get us started for this afternoon, I'd like to welcome our colleagues from the Aerospace Engineering Program. They're going to talk with us about their program, and then we'll turn it over to Ocean, and we'll go from there. So please give a round of applause for Dr. Gary Seidel. All right. Thank you for the welcome. I'm supposed to tell you about aerospace engineering. I'm slightly biased because all three of my degrees are in aerospace engineering, so... As was noted, I am uh, Dr. Seidel. I'm in the, the Assistant Department Head for Academic De Affairs in the uh, Kevin T. Crofton Department of Aerospace and Ocean Engineering. I'm going to only talk about the aerospace side, and then one of my colleagues will talk to you about the ocean side. But this is kind of our unique uh, Frankenstein version of our department. We do all of these things at once. And part of the reason for doing that is because there's some similarity and overlap in the technical discipline, but also because we also get to always be number one. That we're the only aerospace and ocean engineering department in the entire world, so we win by default. So what is aerospace engineering? In a brief nutshell, it's how planes fly and how rockets work. So for those of you that haven't been indoctrinated into aerospace and engineering, uh, it looks like magic. Right? We have this aerodynamic stuff that happens and a plane flies through the air. We have this uh, propulsion stuff that happens and a rocket gets into space. And everyone seems to move on with life and be just fine. So in a sense, what our program is about is it's like Hogwarts. We're here to teach you magic or witchcraft, depending on your preference. More seriously, what is aerospace engineering? So we're a combination of astronautics and aeronautics. So aeronautics is our science and engineering involved with the analysis, design, and manufacture of air flight capable machines that operate within the atmosphere, and it really should be in any atmosphere, because we can adjust, with uh, the, ex the ex mission being for exploration, recreation, transport, or defense. In contrast, astronautics is the same idea, but scaled outside the atmosphere. So it's the science and engineering involved with the design and manufacture of machines which operate beyond Earth's, or for this matter, any atmospheric uh, location. Again, usually for exploration, more and more so, moving towards recreation. Maybe someday one of you will go to a hotel on the moon or Mars. Uh, hopefully it doesn't break down like in the Martian. 
uh, for transport and for defense. Right, so those are the basic ideas. And our program, having the name of aerospace, is actually a, a, a requirement of ABET, the governing body for, for engineering, that uh, we have to cover both of those disciplines in our degree. Right? So if you're interested in airplanes and you come to an aerospace degree, you're going to get a little bit of aerospace. You're going to get a little bit of astronautics as well. And if you're interested in rockets and satellites, you're going to get a little bit of aircraft, guaranteed. What do aerospace engineers do? Well, we design vehicles including piloted or aircraft or crewed vehicles, spacecraft and space launch vehicles, and remotely piloted or autonomous vehicles. And I'm sure you've seen many of these uh, in, your, in your daily life and in your experiences. Maybe not these particular examples up close, but you've seen them before, right? So uh, drones uh, that get used, uh, the space station, defense aircraft, probably many of you have, uh, maybe some of you were at the game last night and it didn't go the way we wanted it to go. But afterwards, you saw all the airplanes taking off. It's amazing. They can fly in the dark. It's pretty, pretty good engineering there. So how do we do these things? What will you learn? So my view of aerospace is it's really the discipline that requires a lot of technical depth mixed with breadth. Right? So if you're going to build an aircraft, you need to know some things about how to make it go forward. Propulsion, right? You need to know how, how to make sure it doesn't fall apart. You need to make sure you know how aerodynamics work. So there's a lot of things that go into it. If you became an engineer that focused only on one of those items, your airplane might end up looking like one of these on the left. Right? You might have something that uh, clearly is not going to fly. Right? If, you're, if you're looking at the stress analysis there, right, it looks like a bunch of sticks. Well, that's easy to analyze for stress, but it doesn't fly worth a darn. Right? Same thing on the rocket side. If you're thinking about how to build a rocket, uh, you may think all you have to do is put a big uh, firework underneath a, a, a tube and there you go. It's not far from that, but there's a lot more that goes on, on there than in making these uh, vehicles work. And so people have to recognize that what we're really teaching you is the technical depth to be able to communicate across those technical disciplines and actually design a system. So we're actually a little bit of an integrated systems engineering degree. So what we focus on, uh, you have to learn some aerodynamics, right? So low and high speed aerodynamics, right? So from the subsonic regime that you're accustomed to, let's say, and looking at something like a propeller-driven aircraft, up through the uh, transonic and supersonic and hypersonic regimes of, let's say, a re-entry vehicle. Dynamics and control of aerospace vehicles, so how to make it go where you want it to go. Lightweight and high-strength structural analysis and design. So uh, those of you that love deforms, when you get there, this is the place for you. Air breathing and chemical propulsion, and of course, the last part, system integration and vehicle design. So again, I want to emphasize the technical depth with that breadth, because what you have to do in building one of these things is think about how do I talk to the other team members, right? Nobody builds an airplane by themselves anymore. I mean, even the Wright brothers were the brothers, right? It wasn't just the Wright. So you have to work together. So for an example, uh, let's say you want to uh, build an aircraft, and you think, okay, what is the uh, underlying thing that I need the most? Well, most people would raise their hand and say, oh, it's aerodynamics. I have to know the aerodynamics of the aircraft. True, I agree, you have to know the aerodynamics, but everything that we build has structure, right? And in most cases, let's say you're building a bridge or another structure, you're thinking about that structure as, oh, I just need to make sure it doesn't fail structurally, right? I need to make sure it's strong enough to carry the loads. Well, in this case, you have to make sure that not only does it not fail because of the loads, but also it doesn't become too heavy, right? Because we're trying to push a vehicle through the air that's heavier than the air. So that means we need to be cognizant of how heavy it is, and then we need to think about how stiff it is. Because if we do all this wonderful aerodynamics, assuming that we have a rigid body, and then we turn around and actually put it into a flight test, what we find out is wings bend. And when wings bend, the aerodynamics change. And if they've changed fast enough, we build a flapping airplane. And I don't know how many of you have been on airplanes, but if you saw a flapping wing outside, you'd probably get a little bit nervous. So we have to do this with a, the mindset of keeping people safe and also not inciting panic. All right, so that ties structures and aerodynamics together. What about dynamics and control? Well, as that aircraft is also deforming, right, it's also changing the aerodynamics. It's also going to change how the airplane handles. But let's say you're into one of these aircraft that's maybe one of my favorites, an F-18 and you're going to, let's say, uh, happen to have a need to, we'll keep it nice, just drop an external tank, right? You have a fuel tank, you're done with it, you're gonna drop it off. If you have an unbalanced load, then you have to ask the question, if, if one wing has a fuel tank and the other doesn't, am I going to be able to control this aircraft? 
right? That means you have to talk to each other, right? You have to talk to the structures person, the dynamics and control person, the aerodynamics person, right? Because they can tell you how much drag there will be with the side that has the fuel tank and the side that doesn't have the fuel tank. So really, I see our program as, again, systems integration, but with the technical depth to support that. Okay, sounds like a lot. It is a lot, right? We keep, you, we keep our students very busy, uh, but we also have three excellent advisors in our program, and I would say not only can they help you navigate exactly where you need to go in terms of courses, they can help you find the courses that suit your passion, right? So as you progress through our program, you start to recognize that, hey, I, as an aerospace person, I might like it all, right? But as you get further down, you realize there's something I like a little bit more. Maybe I like the aerodynamics more, maybe I like the structures more, maybe I like the dynamics and control more. Within our program, we have a lot of tech electives that fit into different tracks. And our advisors can help you find that track that works for you and gets you down the path that you want to go, right, to build your resume. And I will tell you also that they have a great rapport with our faculty as well and can direct you to the faculty that you're interested in talking to in case you want to learn more about those disciplines. All right, student opportunities. So speaking of that note of faculty, one of the opportunities we offer is undergraduate research. I know most of our departments on campus do. We strongly encourage our students to do this because we want to give you an opportunity to interact with faculty in a way that's outside the classroom that gets you into a position where if you're asking a faculty member for a letter of recommendation down the road, they can say something more than what they saw in the classroom. They can say what you did in their research group. It also gives you an opportunity to explore the notion of graduate school, if that's something that you may be considering as you get to become a junior or a senior. Uh, so you get this idea. But not only that, you can roll it all together and use that as a tech elective for your uh, aerospace degree. So a lot of advantages to taking that path if you're so inclined. Other opportunities are the design teams that our department uh, supports. So one of our design teams uh, is Orbital Launch Vehicle Team. So if you're interested in rockets, they're target idea there is to actually get a rocket into orbit. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty lofty goal for a university-led team. Uh, right now, the only people that have done that have been just governments right, around the world, and only a few of those. Uh, we have Virginia Tech's Design Build Fly. So this is a competition that's supported by one of our professional societies. And every year, this design challenge changes. And every year, they have to build an RC plane that uh, kind of breaks the laws of what you thought was possible. Uh, we also have a wind turbine team. So within our, our department, we also have kind of a green engineering track, which is focused on offshore and onshore wind energy. Uh, so if you wanted to help design turbines for that uh, side of things, there's a team that does this. Uh, we have teams that on the ocean side, so I'll leave the ocean side there to talk. We also have teams that are um, on the mining side, if you will, right, that collaborate with some of the mining students and doing things like uh, lunar robotic mining or Mars uh, robotic mining as well. And then uh, branching out into things like uh, the Hyperloop teams, et cetera. So we have a lot of opportunities. And moreover, we, was, we support those opportunities with some of the uh, resources we have in our department. So one of them is the AOE Studio for Design and Innovation. So if you've been on the second floor of Randolph and you've seen those fishbowl where all these students are in there working feverishly, that's where all our senior design students are busy working. We also have a lot of space out at uh, Advanced Engineering Design Lab, so several of these teams that are on the previous slide have a bay out there for doing their construction. Uh, we also have um, the Rocketry Laboratory and the Kentland Experimental Aerial Systems Lab, so there's a small uh, uh, hangar, if you will, for RC type and rocketry type uh, uh, vehicles, that, and we actually have a small runway out there, and so uh, some Saturdays you might find an, an email out there saying, hey, we're going to go launch rockets, or hey, we're going to go fly aircraft. Uh, and so a lot of those actions take place out at Kentland. It's not very far. Uh, it's just on the other side of Price's Fork, the town of Price's Fork. And so if you really <clears throat> are thinking about how to organize your day, right, you can go out there in the morning, watch some rockets launch, hope that we don't hit the Radford Arsenal, which is right across the river. <clears throat> and assuming we don't, then you can just go further down in McCoy to where the junction is and get on a tube and float the river, right? So you can get this all in one day. Not that I've ever done that before, never. Other student opportunities. So we have a professional society, uh, the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, we also have some other, that's the big society within there, some other societies that we have, Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International, Society of Women in Aviation and Space Exploration, and Society of Flight Test Engineers are some of the bigger uh, organizations. We also have uh, Sigma Gamma Tau, which is our professional honor society for aerospace. 
All right, so what about jobs, right? That's what you're all <clears throat> really wanting to know. In fact, we had a, a, an event for sophomores the other night, or for juniors, sorry, the other night, and the first thing that they were asking about were internships. So what do you do with this degree? Well, obviously, you can go in the aerospace industry. That's the easy one. But what else can you do? Well, <clears throat> somebody has to monitor the aerospace industry, so that's usually the federal government. So there's tons of federal agencies you could go into. Defense industry <clears throat> has a subset, so it may be that you're uh, in the defense portion that deals with aircraft or rockets, or you may actually be uh, supporting the defense industry in a different way. Renewable energy industry um, is another aspect, or again, because of the wind turbine technology. And then in terms of uh, types of companies, you can do the big companies, the Boeings, the Lockheed Martins, uh, or you can also look at uh, smaller companies that we have that come in and recruit our students. Some of our students choose to go to graduate school, and that's great. Some of them choose to actually leave aerospace and go into other, uh, what, we, what you see is other disciplines, right? So maybe automotive engineering, structural engineering, uh, environmental engineering, uh, consulting, or even medicine or law. And I attribute that in part because of that technical depth and breadth that we have, right? So that breadth gives you that ability to work across disciplines and uh, really make yourself uh, an asset to a company. Uh, along those lines, you know, there's the Expo, which I'm sure many of you heard about. We also have a, a, a kind of a separate thing, which is the Aerospace Defense and Intelligence Career Fair. So this just happened uh, earlier this week. And we had on the order of 40 companies, uh, some of them you'd recognize, like NASA or uh, maybe Northrop Grumman, if you follow the aerospace field. And some of them you might not recognize, so some of the smaller firms out there. But that was a lot of companies that came in. We had a, on the order of 600 or so students uh, attend that event as well. So our department size is roughly uh, on the order of about 600 students. So uh, that tells you that not every aerospace student went there, or they could have, but uh, we also open this to other disciplines that might be interested in the uh, aerospace defense and intelligence areas. So even if you choose not to do aerospace, do keep your eye open uh, for these opportunities. And I think my last slide here is to uh, remind you of contact information. So again, I'm Professor Seidel. My email's there. If you have any further questions about aerospace engineering, of course, we'll be on the panel here as well. You can ask there. Um, we also have one of our undergraduate advisors here tonight, and some of our AOE ambassadors will be in the, in the back afterwards. If you have specific questions about aerospace or even ocean, they can answer those as well. So I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, but I'm going to go ahead and stop there and turn it over to my colleague for ocean engineering. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Wang. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Aerospace and Ocean Engineering. Um, I do research in fluid structure interaction and more generally computational mechanics. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk a bit about uh, our ocean engineering undergraduate program. Uh, again, the first question you have in, in mind is uh, what is ocean engineering, right? Um, I have a very short answer here design of uh, ocean vehicles and uh, structures, which include ships, small boats, submarines, un underwater, unmanned underwater vehicles, unmanned surface vehicles, these uh, autonomous vehicles, and also a lot of uh, different types of offshore structures, such as uh, platforms, wind turbines, pipelines, etc. okay? Um, when talking about ocean engineering, it's uh, uh, helpful to have a few numbers in mind. 90% uh, of traded go goods worldwide are transported by ships. Okay. Um, the total amount of marine renewable energy available to the United States is 2300 terawatt hour per year, if you're not familiar with this unit. Okay, so this number is roughly 50% of the total electricity consumption in the country. Uh, also, United States has the most uh, powerful navy in the world, which is also pretty expensive. 
Um, the annual budget of the Navy is uh, over $200 billion. Okay. Um, next, okay, what do we offer to our OE students? We teach our students methods and tools for analyzing and designing ocean vehicles. Uh, if you look at our curriculum, most of the, in, in most of the courses, uh, we lean towards uh, uh, surface vehicles, particularly big, large surface vehicles, which means ships. Okay? However, um, most, uh, a lot of the materials that you actually learn are equally applicable to small boats, under submarines, underwater vehicles, and uh, uh, offshore, offshore structures as well. Okay? Now, um, as we, you can imagine, ships, submarines, these t vehicles are designed uh, rationally which means uh, as a designer, designer or analyst, you need to learn uh, fluid and structural mechanics series, also vehicle dynamics and control. Also, you need to be able to use uh, computer software, which includes uh, uh, computer-aided uh, design software, CAD, uh, finite element uh, structural mechanics anal analysis tools, and also computational fluid dynamics tools, CFD software. Also, you need uh, um, to learn uh, skills. You need to have skills of uh, testing uh, structural dynamics, for example, vibration, structural deformation, mechanics of uh, materials, and uh, uh, fluid flow. Okay? These are laboratory test skills. And we offer courses, lab laboratory courses. And in the senior year, the last year of the program, um, you will form a team with uh, uh, classmates and then really work on the design of a, of a complete vehicle. In most cases, this would be a complete ship okay, under supervision. Um, also, in terms of uh, technical areas of uh, studies, you know, uh, as you can imagine, there are different uh, fields. <laughs> Uh, first, uh, hull form. This is about the geometry or the shape of uh, vehicles. Okay? In order to achieve uh, um, better performance, you need to, to carefully design the shape of a ship. Okay? Also, stability. This means uh, keeping uh, the, the ship afloat to avoid the capsizing okay? in different conditions, even in damaged conditions. Okay? Hydrodynamics is very important, for example, for us predicting resistance and uh, uh, impact of ocean waves on a ship or the impact of ocean uh, of, uh, waves on um, submarines, okay, hydrodynamics. Also, um, structures, for example, in what conditions uh, the, uh, a beam or a plate on the surface of a ship would uh, undergo plastic, uh, permanent deformation or just fracture. Also, uh, structural materials, mm, how to select and how to compare different uh, ship building materials from steels to aluminum alloys to you know, composite materials, how to make a decision. And then propulsion, this is often about the design and selection of uh, marine propellers. Vehicle dynamics, how to control the vehicle including and also oceanography, which is about the science of the ocean environment. Okay? These are some important uh, technical areas you will learn in the ocean engineering undergraduate program. Um, of course, we, our department has uh, uh, academic advisors. If you have any questions regarding you know, courses, uh, regarding the mm, program in general, or job opportunities, career development opportunities. Uh, you can mm, consult uh, any one of the three advisors here, Emily, Brian, and Chelsea, either in person or on Zoom. Okay. Uh, their office is located in, in the Randolph Hall on the second floor, room 215. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about some mm, student opportunities that are specific to the OE Program. Okay, first uh, we have some uh, some design teams that recruit new members every year. For example, here uh, HPS stands for Human Powered uh, Submarine. Okay, sounds interesting. Uh, if you are interested in underwater the underwater world, 
Uh, Virginia Tech still bought, this is about designing and uh, fabricating and testing robotic uh, ships and robotic submarines. Okay. You see some nice uh, photos here. Um, and there are a few other, several other design teams specific to the ocean engineering program. Um, also, uh, students in our department are, have a lot of opportunities to get expose, exposed uh, to research. Okay? Um, the faculty in our department lead many research projects support, uh, sponsored by the Office of Naval Research, Navy Research Labs, NSF, National Science Foundation, and uh, companies. Okay? Uh, what, they're, what they are seeing on the right are really a gallery that shows different uh, research topics and projects led by our faculty, you know, starting from uh, very fundamental fluid dynamics and structural mechanics research topics. At, at the very top, you are looking at a single bubble, okay? both uh, laboratory tests and uh, high-performance uh, computation using supercomputers. Okay? Well, here, um, don't... Uh, underestimate the power of little bubbles. Okay, they can be quite, uh, can cause, cause damage, significant damage to uh, underwater structures, for in particular propellers. Okay? Uh, here you can also see the design projects that, are, that, that work, you know, focus on the design and improvement of marine propellers, the testing, uh, a lab experiment that tests the performance of uh, flexible, lightweight uh, ship structures, and then uh, some weapon effects underwater, explosion, implosion type of things, and also submarine uh, fluid dynamics, ship-related fluid dynamics uh, research projects. Okay? Um, as Dr. Sadell mentioned, many students in our department register for AOE 4994, uh, undergraduate research. This is uh, a course you can you, know, you talk to a faculty member and then design a, a supervised uh, research project together, and then you get credit uh, for your research uh, participate, partici your, your research efforts. Okay. Um, also, some students are paid <laughs> through research assistantships, um, fellowships. For example, the uh, the NSF has this uh, research for research experience for undergraduate students, REU opportunity, uh, and also uh, internships, okay? Some students get paid for their research efforts. Um, my general suggestion is that if you're interested in doing aerospace and ocean, or ocean <laughs> engineering research, feel free to uh, first look at uh, our website, and also feel free to talk to directly to any faculty member in our department, okay? Again, on the left, you are seeing some other projects. This is mm, some very interesting projects on, uh, you can see, unconventional marine propulsion that mimics uh, ship, uh, uh, fish and different types of marine animals, okay? Um, career development, development okay? Uh, many of our OE students get summer internships in different ways. For example, there is this uh, v, uh, Virginia Tech Engineering Expo that you probably already know. Also, there is another expo, this is the Aerospace Defense and Intelligence Career Fair. Also, uh, uh, every year, um, you know, there are shipbuilding companies, there are uh, Navy labs that you know, come to this uh, career fair. Also, our department offers a uh, alumni mentoring program, which will, which can match you with an alumni, a former student, uh, and that can lead to a lot of uh, collaborations and uh, job opportunities. Uh, also, Virginia Tech has a National Security Institute that offers uh, summer internships. Um, there are multiple professional societies that welcome our OE students. Uh, most of our students are members of SNAMI, which stands for the Society of uh, Naval Architects and Marine Engineers. Okay. So this is the primary, I would say, primary professional society for our, our OE students. Now, um, I think this is something very interesting, double major in both aerospace engineering and ocean engineering. Okay. Um, our AE and OE programs share many courses and many similar 
requirements. As a result, OE students need, uh, I think based on our latest revision to the curriculum, OE students really just need uh, three extra courses to double major in AE if you design your study carefully. So just really three extra courses and then you get uh, a double major in both aerospace engineering and ocean engineering. Okay? Um, from, in my opinion, this is a very good uh, opportunity. Uh, however, you know, when we say three extra courses or four extra courses, it does not mean arbitrary three or four arbitrary extra, extra courses. You have to design your study very carefully. So if you are interested, please uh, talk to our ad academic advisors as soon as possible. Um, our OE graduate students typically go to these uh, companies, okay, companies and uh, government uh, agencies. Um, you know, in shipbuilding industry, this is the most common uh, uh, career path. Uh, you know, Virginia, the, state, the, the Commonwealth of Virginia has two very big uh, shipyards in the uh, Norfolk or Newport News area. Okay, this is uh, Norfolk Naval Shipyard and uh, Newport News Shipbuilding. Uh, also in Maryland, very close to Virginia, uh, there's this uh, Cadillac uh, Naval Surface Warfare Center that also hires a lot of our students. Um, you can find other uh, companies uh, on this web page, okay, uh, on this uh, slide. Uh, shipbuilding companies, engineering firms, and also graduate school, okay. Some students go to graduate school. Uh, in addition to these uh, conventional or typical um, career paths, there are other job or career opportunities. For example, renewable energy, okay. Um, uh, uh, there, you know, uh, um, you may be designing renewable energy harvesting machines that operate either in the ocean or in the atmospheric uh, environment. Okay, in ocean, there's uh, ocean wave energy, uh, offshore uh, turbines, these things, and also ocean thermal energy that can be harvested, okay? Um, also, don't forget the oil and gas uh, industry. <laughs> it is uh, still a big industry and also quite uh, lucrative. Uh, remember that 30% of oil and natural gas comes from the ocean, <laughs> so there are a lot of uh, job opportunities. Uh, on the design and analysis of offshore platforms, risers, pipelines, etc. Also, remote sensing, this is a relatively new uh, area. Okay? Um, this is where um, people tr collect information or data about the ocean, but from a distance, typically from aircraft or satellites. Okay? This is a very good uh, um, area if you are interested in both air aerospace engineering and ocean engineering. Uh, lastly, I would uh, uh, mention that uh, um, if you consider uh, ocean engineers um, as a profession, including naval architects and marine engineers, um, this profession has a very interesting, very good position in the job market compared to many other uh, careers, other professions. Okay. Um, if you consider both income and uh, the availability of uh, jobs, okay, um, under some mechanisms, this can be you know, ocean engineering. Ocean engineers are ranked uh, very high. Okay. A few years ago, there was a ranking uh, that uh, considers uh, you see medium income, unemployed, unemployment rate, and higher education holders percentage. And then, you know, based, some, based on some algorithm, it turns out that naval and marine, marine engineering is, is, is number one, okay? That's one statistics, okay? one ranking, okay? So naval architecture and marine engineering, based on this um, survey and uh, ranking, is the most valuable major, according to a ranking of 162 college majors, okay? So in the case, um, there is a, 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 a fixed, well-defined uh, need of ocean engineers by the, in the country, um, the supply is relatively small. Okay? There are not a, a large number of uh, universities that offer ocean engineering degrees. 
So that's if you, if you join our if you, you know, department and uh, get a degree in ocean engineering, you have some advantage in the job market. Okay. That closes my talk. Uh, if you have any other questions or, need, or want to get more information, these are some uh, uh, resources. Okay, our website, Twitter, Facebook, Insta Instagram, maybe some other newer <laughs> platforms that I'm not aware of. Okay. Anyway, uh, my name is Kevin Wang. I'm an associate professor in the department. Feel free to talk to me if you have any questions. Also, feel free to uh, talk to our academic uh, advisors in the department. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. John Shuchuk. I'm an associate professor in the Industrial Systems Engineering Department, I'm also the associate department head and the undergraduate program director. So let me talk to you about our program. First thing I want to talk about is what is industrial and systems engineering? So here's a definition which is often seen. Industrial and systems engineers, ISCs, they're concerned with the design, development, improvement, implementation, and evaluation of integrated systems of people, information, and equipment. So there's a lot of breadth to what we're doing. You can see no products or things specified there. I'm gonna to touch base on that in a minute. Our profession relies mainly on the mathematical, physical, and social sciences. We also use content from other areas such as business, psychology, statistics, accounting, and economics. Now, one of the things we often find in ISE is that students looking to choose a major, they really don't have a very good idea of what ISE is or what ISEs do, and I don't know that that definition really clarifies it much. So I want to take a few minutes and try to give you a better idea of what ISEs do, okay? So the key thing in that definition, the most two important words, two most important words there, are systems and people, okay? Systems and people, that's the core, at the core of what IECs do. I'll ask you to think for a moment of some of the other engineering majors that you may be f more familiar with and what they're involved with, what they do. For example, mechanical engineers. A lot of people have an idea about mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineers make things that move, right? They transmit force or torque or mechanical power. Um, how about civil engineers? Civil engineers try to make things that don't move, right? Bridges, buildings, roadways. Electrical engineers, they're making things that generate, transmit, process, or otherwise work with electrical signals or electrical power, okay? In all of these cases, these engineers are concerned with making things to satisfy a specific need, a specific purpose. But what we find is that these things that these other engineers are designing are seldom used in isolation. They're more often used with other things. They work together in a system with some higher level objective. Furthermore, usually we have people involved in these systems. So that's the idea of the systems aspect in people and that's at the heart of what IECs do. Let me give you another example. Think of machines that are used in manufacturing facilities. Someone has to design those machines. So those are usually predominantly mechanical engineers and maybe you have electrical engineers involved in the control systems and things like that. But say I wanna have a manufacturing facility. Someone has to decide what types of machines we need, how many of them, how we arrange them in our plant and how we're going to run them. And furthermore, seeing as we very often have people either running or monitoring these machines, we need people to train, supervise, manage, schedule these different workers. These are the things that ISEs do. Another example, airplanes, aircraft. So the design of aircraft predominantly by 
aerospace, aeronautical engineers with help of mechanical and electrical and some other engineers. So they're designing aircraft to satisfy some particular purpose and also to satisfy certain constraints that have to be met. Say I have an airline, so I have an obvious interest in aircraft. Someone has to decide, what kind of aircraft do I need? How many of them? Where should they be located? Where are the hubs? Where is maintenance done? And how often? What routes do we fly? What is our schedule? Additionally, there is obviously people involved in this type of a system. For example, the flight crews. Someone has to figure out what crews are with which aircraft. What trips do they take? Where do they change over? Where are they stationed? A system a lot of people involved, those are also problems that ISCs will solve, okay? So hopefully that gives you a better idea where not so much in designing particular things as how these things work together. One thing I should mention though is with the people aspect, ISC is also concerned with things that are designed and have some type of interaction with humans. So think for example of the seats in your car or appliances that you use at home that are ergonomically designed or your smartphone, how important is it to have a good interface? Anything that's designed where there's an interaction or a role for a person, ISCs also have a part there. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little better idea of what ISCs do. So with that in mind, I don't feel it's a far stretch to state that ISC is the broadest engineering discipline. Here are some of the areas that ISCs work in, manufacturing, logistics and distribution, healthcare, Banking, retail, military, consulting, entertainment, government organizations. As long as it's a system with people, things are working together and there's resource constraints and we have to do scheduling and assignment of these things, ISCs are involved, okay? Whatever the area, ISCs are trying to make a system and a process work, but we're also aiming at certain um, characteristics making sure our systems have high productivity and quality and always with the systems worldview. A little bit about our particular program. We're usually very highly ranked over the past, um, well, multiple decades. We're currently ranked uh, number four right now in US News and World Report. Our undergraduate program, as you can see, we have ample scholarship opportunities available on an annual basis for our undergraduate students. Jobs for industrial engineers are always plentiful. As you can guess from the prior slide, ISCs, they work everywhere. They work everywhere. Proje pro jobs are projected to grow about 10% over the next decade, decade according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We have about a 95% placement rate by the time of graduation, with the majority of those going to the workforce, about 84%, and a little over 10% going to graduate school. So what will students learn in ISC? So I'm not going through individual courses, but just some of the areas. That we have four main areas in industrial and systems engineering, and the first of these is manufacturing, okay? So designing and improving manufacturing facilities and how they're operated. So a few minutes ago, I gave the example of some engineers will design the machines and ISCs will figure out how many we need and where we put them and so on and so on. That's part of designing a manufacturing facility, but there's more than that. There's the material handling aspect, the storage aspect, integrating these machines and devices to work together. How about the people? There's all the training that goes on and assigning workers, as well as the planning of production. Every manufacturing facility has the goal of producing certain types of parts. We have to decide how we're going to produce this, how many of each item at what time. That's called production planning. So these are things that we teach our students in manufacturing. We have four courses focused on these areas of manufacturing. The second area is what operates called operations research. So this is the use of advanced mathematical methods to help make better decisions and plans. So all engineers, all engineering, ma all engineering majors are going to learn and use to various extents in school and their careers, differential calculus and integral calculus. But there's a whole other domain of mathematics that is really more or less the purview of industrial systems engineers. That has to do with operations research. That's a whole other way to solve problems. Problems where we're trying to choose between a vast, uncountable many times, 
set of possible alternatives when we're designing something. So think of the airline example I just gave. I'm trying to decide for my airline um, what cities should I fly to and what should the routes be and how often should we go. And you can probably think, wow, there's a whole lot of different ways to do that. How do we decide how to do it? We're looking for the best or the optimal solution. So operations research is, by and large, tackling problems like that with operations research methods and techniques. So we, have, we teach our students something called probabilistic operations research and deterministic operations research, optimization methods, solving these problems, trying to get optimal solutions. But we also teach something called discrete simulation. You may have heard about simulation. That's when we have a problem that is really so hard or difficult to model mathematically that we'll take an alternative approach. Let's build a computer model of this process or system and just run it over and over and change things and see what works well. So that's another thing we teach our students, discrete simulation. Another area we teach our students is human factors and ergonomics. So observe, evaluate, and design products or systems that increase the user efficiency or well-being. So as I mentioned earlier, working with workers and training them, uh, anytime there's products involved, if we're trying to design a product where there is a physical interaction with a human, an ergonomically designed chair, some power tools you'll use, or trying to make workers safe in the workplace with respect to how often they do jobs and how much they lift and things like that, that's physical ergonomics. We also teach our students about cognitive ergonomics, which is how the human mind interacts with and processes data. So you're all familiar with processing data through a computer screen or a smartphone. It's important that that interface is well designed. Well, that's what ISCs do. That's part of their job. They also work on designing much more complicated and critical uh, user interfaces. Think, for example, the cockpit of an aircraft, of a 747, or a nuclear reactor control center. The design of these, this human computer interface, is critical. That's something that ISCs do, and we teach about that in our program. The last one is, and we have two courses by the way, two core courses with human factors and ergonomics. The last of the four areas is management systems, where we're looking at designing and improving management systems uses in business enterprises. So this is how do we, from a management point of view, run our companies and our firms more effectively. The main way we teach this to our students is through our capstone senior design course. So we have a four credit, two and two, two in the fall, two in the spring, and our seniors are in groups of four, five, maybe six students, and they'll do a capstone design problem. They'll solve a problem with a real industrial company. And in doing so, they'll learn about working with other teams and management, project management. So that's a very important part of our curriculum is our capstone design course. Okay? This slide here, I've just got a couple of images of students working in one of our manufacturing labs. So the picture in the upper left are some students running an assembly line. So if you're in manufacturing, it's nice to know what assembly is about. Hey, let's have some students run an assembly line. It's part of the lab they do. And then lower right, the students all get a chance to operate machine tools, running a lathe, learning how to turn apart on a lathe. Part of teaching students about manufacturing. We're not teaching you to be machine operators, but to understand manufacturing. So we have hands-on courses like this that help. A little bit about advising in ISE. We have two full-time undergraduate academic advisors, Paula Van Curen and Jacob Kirsteins. And the support they give is, a lot of it is of, of the typical nature, so one-on-one -on -one personalized advising, which can be either face-to-face -face or, or it can be remote through Zoom. For Zoom, you can schedule it that way. Our advisors also uh, pull extra shifts during course request, because as you know, it's very important you want to get the courses you want, and there's a limited window to do it. So advisors will pull extra duty to help students in our department. Uh, they work with students on certain events, fun events like a welcome back night, an international night, where we have international students and faculty come and tell us stories about their homeland and what they feel is strange or different or unique. Other things they do, they maintain and send um, a Friday newsletter. They have an advising chat series. And at the start of, or an ISC 2004, Intro to Industrial Systems Engineering, which is a core fall sophomore course, they will come and talk to all the students about our program and about the professors and the research and the courses and the options and things like that. Okay? 
talk a little bit about student opportunities, and I'll start with undergraduate research. So like all of the majors, we have a lot of students involved in undergraduate research. We highly promote this. We have a very highly active uh, research faculty getting uh, sponsorship from federal government, state and local government, as well as uh, private industry. About 30% of our students will do undergraduate research. So in our department, it's ISC 4994. It can be done for credit, a volunteer, for pay. The majority of students will do this for credit. So you work out a deal with a professor, you discuss, and you do it for one, two, or three credits in one semester. And you can take up to six credits of undergraduate research to use for IC Tech elective credit in our department. So some of the projects are listed here. So just to give you an idea of the diversity of things that we do for our research um, avenue, machine learning for advanced manufacturing. So that's a combination of manufacturing and OR. Machine learning is actually part of OR. Augmented reality support search and rescue operations, alerting visually impaired pedestrians of traffic. These are in the uh, domain of human factors. Programming autonomous robots for payload delivery. That touches in several areas and in fact overlaps into computer science and computer programming. So a lot of our students are involved in undergraduate research. Co-ops and internships, large number of our students, about 83% do an internship or a co-op. So these range from small boutique type companies to large companies. I've listed some of them here. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with most of these. Walmart, G, Deloitte, a consulting company, Eastman, Moog, Altec, Volvo. Big companies we have students doing both internships and co-ops with. Median wage is shown, and about 14% do an international internship. For example, with Rolls-Royce in England, we've had students go over there to do an internship. Study abroad, we have about almost 20% of our students do a study abroad activity. We have one formal program uh, in existence right now, an exchange program with uh, Pontifical Catholic University of Panera in Parana, pardon me, in Brazil. We also have students who have done summer uh, study abroad, pardon me, in New Zealand and Australia, Spain, South Africa, India, and other countries. And students who are doing study abroad, sometimes it's on in internships as well or research. And as mentioned previously, we have IC specific scholarships available to help students out. Careers in ISE. So as I mentioned, ISE is very broad. <laughs> ISEs work everywhere, all types of professions. About 80% of our students have a full-time job at time of graduation. Keep in mind, not all our students are looking for full-time. Some are going to graduate school, for example. This is an example of some of the positions and the companies. Again, just to give you an idea of the breadth. A Metalsa, manufacturing engineer. That's the manufacturing part of our program. An operations industrial engineer with USPS. Systems engineer with MITRE Corporation. Okay, MITRE Corporation was shown on an earlier slide during the aerospace presentation. Management engineer with Duke Health, so that's someone working in healthcare. A very fast growing area is industrial systems engineering and healthcare. So we have a lot of students go to work in the health area. Be an analyst for Accenture, that's a consulting company. Supply chain associate for PepsiCo, you're all familiar with that company. The Knotts company making end effectors for robots, a position for robotics application engineer. So again, highlighting the breadth of jobs that people get in industrial systems engineering. The last slide showcasing some of the IC uh, student organizations. So these are national organizations for which we have a student chapter, Virginia Tech. So in the center of the slide, we have the flagship organization, which is IISE, Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers. That's the national organization. We have a chapter, Virginia Tech, and it's very active. Um, around that, I've shown some of the other organizations for the different areas, starting in the upper left, Society of Manufacturing Engineers. Then we have a, an organization, a student chapter for systems engineers, people, related to, people really interested in the systems aspect. That's called NCOSI. Then on the right-hand side, American Society for Safety Professionals. So that's having to do with safety, designing safe working conditions and things for people, part of our ergonomics um, side of the program. Human Factors and Ergonomic Society is below there, it's self-explanatory. And then one called INFORMS, which is the Institute for Operations Research and the Management Sciences. So people who are interested in the mathematics, the operations research, that's an organization that a lot of students get involved with. We also have in our department um, an ambassadors organization, IC ambassadors, like some other departments do. 
And these are students who help out our department. It's kind of a service role, but it's very prestigious. They help us with our service activities, help us looking at and planning our curriculum, outreach to students, uh, enrollment, recruitment, activities like that. And on the bottom right is the Industrial Engineering Honor Society Alpha Pi Mu, which we've had a very active chapter um, over the years where traditionally in the top three, usually the top program in the country in Alpha Pi Mu. So we have a very, very strong representation in the academic community in the United States through Alpha Pi Mu. And I think that is the end of my presentation. So I'll look forward to any questions. If you want to contact me or our advisors, feel free to do so. My email is on the web. And good luck, everyone, with your choices. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Renee Bryan. I am the Assistant Director for Academic Affairs within the Department of Building Construction. So this is actually my first time here, and that is because we have just recently moved into the College of Engineering. We've been in the College of Architecture. So while we are new to the college, we actually graduated out our first building construction graduate in 1947. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're old in that aspect. Uh, so what do we do? We create vertical structures, spaces, and systems with a focus on business and construction management, innovation and emerging technologies, and the performance and sustainability of these structures. In other words, we build things. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to show you. We build big things. So let me introduce you to one of our students who has been building stadiums for the past three summers with her internships. In fact, Hunter just accepted a full-time position in which her job description, her project assignments are going to be stadiums or sports facilities within the U.S. So she's very excited. Uh, she'll be beginning at $80,000. With a housing stipend of $550 a week as she is going across the U.S. building stadiums. This is really just an example of one of our students because offers are coming in at this point uh, for full-time employment. Who we are. Let me tell you a little bit about our structure, the Myers Lawson School of Construction. The school administers two degrees. One of the degrees is a Bachelor of Science in Building Construction. The other degree is a Bachelor of Science in Construction, Engineering, and Management. There are ways that we differ. For instance, BC is a non-engineering degree. CEM is an engineering degree. 
In BC, you enter straight into the major. In CEM, you enter into the College of Engineering and take the first year engineering courses. BC has a focus on entrepreneurship and management. CEM is more of a focus with STEM and management. Our similarities are much more than our differences. So we share faculty, classes, clubs, internships, career fairs, research, organizations, labs, and facilities. So one of the facilities we will be sharing really soon, hopefully March 2024, is HID Hall. And this is actually made possible because our industry kept coming to us and asking for more students. Can you give us more students? Can you give us more students? But, you know, we were limited um, with our resources and our current facility, which is Bishop Favreau Hall. So through five key donors, they went out and raised money to build this new facility, which is being built right outside in our parking lot as we speak. So the building will actually have two sections. Uh, one of it will be a dining hall, which we desperately need, and the other will be the Myers Lawson School, which will have innovative classrooms and spaces and great learning places together with students. What we learn. So within new technologies, emerging construction technologies, we offer a variety of benefits, and that ranges from reduced labor, these new technologies, um, with material costs to shorter project, uh, project completion and timelines, uh, improved worker safety, higher product quality. Some of these new technologies that we are studying right now, drone technology, virtual and augmented reality, autonomous equipment, wireless sensors, robotics, spot the robot, robotic dog. Maybe some of you saw him during uh, Welcome Week dancing. He dances to Taylor Swift. Wearable technologies. And our first, this is a 3D house being printed. Uh, one of our faculty, Dr. Andrew McCoy, uh, we worked on this with his team, and it's actually 3D printing an entire house. And what this is going to do is this is hopefully going to offset some of the cost so we can offer more affordable housing, which is desperately needed in Virginia and nationwide. Our curriculum. We are team-based, project-based, and hands-on. No matter how good a constructor you are, you're not going to build a stadium by yourself. So you will start working within teams within your first year courses. Within our tracks, or within our curriculum, we have four tracks of studies. And this is something you will choose during your second semester in BC. The four tracks that we currently have are emergent technologies for construction, housing, and development. Information systems in the built environment, that's your building informational modeling, your BIM, your virtual construction. Because actually, you know, it's, it's built twice. It's going to be built on the computer to find out any flaws before they ever break ground, so this is very important. Sustainable building performance and a restricted elective track, which most of our students that pursue this track will do a double major with real estate. This is what I call our holy trinity of classes within building construction. So what this is, is teams work together throughout the semester. They will get a RFP, a request for proposal, and sophomores, juniors, and seniors work together to put in a competitive and a formal bid similar to what you would be doing in the industry. And this culminates, um, we have a design capstone experience, which is done in front of some of the biggest names in industry. They come down each semester to judge our capstones. We have engaging classrooms where you actually get out of your seat and do things. 
engaging labs, and engaging advisors. So this is, these guys are absolutely the best. Um, they love their students and it shows. Gary routinely cries at every graduation I'm with them, uh, but that's because we truly form a bond with our students that I think transcends the average. Opportunities within BC. Scholarships, over 100,000 construction specific scholarships are awarded each year. Competition teams. Our students compete in national competitions across the U.S. Study abroad in service learning. This is actually pictures from two service learning uh, projects that I did with students prior to COVID. Uh, we went to Belize City, built something. We went to Kauai, Hawaii, and built something there. Other ones have been Vietnam. Uh, we typically do a winter study abroad to Portugal and Peru, which we will be bringing back now that we can travel again. In field trips, we like to get our students out of the classroom and actually experiencing construction. So each year I take our first year class, uh, in fact we have this coming up in October, uh, to a job site. We spend the night, uh, so it's great bonding as well, but many times it's the first time these students are actually on a commercial site. So that's me down there with the students. That's also me in that elevator going up to about 50 stories. Um, it was so cold that day. If you thought it was cold last night and windy, that day it was in the 30s, the wind chill factor up on that 43rd floor actually froze the insulin pump of one of my students no longer than we were up there. So yeah, it's cold. Internships and career fairs. This is where we get really excited. We had our construction career fair Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. And we had 135 companies present. Okay. Now again, I can talk about our career fair or I can show you something about our career fair. many students as we can get into the program, we can get them out of the program and get jobs. My sophomore year I had five internship offers. My junior year I had six internship offers. I signed a full-time job offer on the first day of senior year. I, I wish there was a hundred more students that we could hire tomorrow because they're all great kids. Rather than compete for jobs, the companies are actually competing for our students. These are professional jobs, a lot of money to be made by the students. The employers tell me and a lot of these folks start career fair, go to other career fairs, and they tell us our students are, are by far the best students in the country. It's just an awesome display of talent that's coming out of Myers Loss's School of Construction. We have almost 40 young men and women that have graduated from Virginia Tech and come through our intern program that are project executives, senior level project managers, pre-construction managers, superintendents. I think Virginia Tech is, is in Myers-Lawson has focused on what the industry needs. And when I started 12 years ago, really they were not hiring um, first year internships. So I mean, I went around to the companies and, and it's like, why? And the need is so great now, but also we really work, I uh, teach the first year experience class, so we really work with our first year students, with their resumes, with their presentation, with their professional skills, and they go out and um, I met a student in the bookstore at the ball game last night, and he came up and he was so excited. I mean, he's only been uh, in here, what, five, six weeks, and it's like, I got an internship, you know, I've got an internship offer last night, or at the career fair, so he was so excited, which makes me excited. Our students do internships all across the nation, California, Texas, Utah. I've had some go to Hawaii, yeah. Um, a lot of them are in the metropolitan DC area as well. So careers, what do you do? That it, it's, it's such a broad discipline when you get out there. Uh, you can be in the field, you can be in the office. Um, 
Here is one story from an alum that we are especially proud of. Kimberly Roy's passion for building came at a young age. She was 10 years old when she told her parents she wanted to move to New York City and build skyscrapers. It surprised my parents. They are not in the building industry and really a lot of builders are generational, so it was unique. That passion ultimately led her to Virginia Tech. I started studying architecture. I didn't even know there was a, a building construction program. So I transferred into building construction and again, it was foundational to my career trajectory, my time in Blacksburg and, and getting that important knowledge at a, at a young age uh, cemented my passion for building. Kim, a 1999 alumna, is now CEO of HIT Contracting, an award-winning nationwide construction company. I left Virginia Tech and I came as an assistant manager. I went right out into the field and I worked on construction sites for the first 12 years of my career. Being a CEO never crossed her mind. Did you aspire to be a CEO? Was that part of the plan too? No, I wanted to be a builder. I thought that was cool. Nearly 15 years into her career, Kim's interest in the business side of construction peaked. Hit gave her the opportunity to pursue it. Anytime I went to the, the owners and said, I'd like more runway. Can I take a shot at, at working on a new system or a new tool or, you know, how about we, uh, we think about a different way to organize uh, part of our corporate resources team, things like this. They always said, go for it. And I felt like I had a lot of ability to control my career, but also support. Being a woman in an industry where less than 10% of the workforce is female has its challenges, some self-imposed. I think the challenges were more, sometimes I would limit myself. You know, I think that, um, you know, I, I would, my perception was if I was out in the field that maybe someone didn't want to show me how to thread that pipe. When in fact, I went out and I said, hey, can you show me what you're doing? The craftsmen were so, mainly men, were, were so excited to and proud to show me. And they were like, wow, someone cares about this? They didn't care whether I was a man or a woman, but it may be in my head. Kim shares it's important for women to see women in leadership roles. So now I, I love talking and saying, hey, let me tell you about my career. Let me explain to you my, my degree from Virginia Tech and what building construction and, um, and, and all that that entails means. More than 20 years after joining HIT, Kim says there's no better time to be in construction. It is a very exciting time to be in construction. We are looking at ways to transform the industry and the way we did things many years ago, we need to see a rapid change. I think particularly in the areas of technology, in the areas of, of new materials, of the, the productivity of how we build, our clients are seeing rising prices and we have to find a way to make housing and building more affordable to, to everyone. So I think there's a, a great challenge to unlock there. And for all my females out there, we need more females in the industry, so come talk to me. Uh, let me see, why choose BC? I'm going to give you a student perspective. So this is Zach Feldman, he's a BC junior, senior, yeah. How is everyone tonight? Um, can I get a show of hands? Who drove, who lives in a dorm, or um, who uses a water utility? Let's see a show of hands. You guys are affected by construction managers. That is our industry. Um, we are building everything from road bridges and highways to commercial buildings. Um, the building construction department here at Virginia Tech is a hidden gem. Um, I came in, my kind of background, I'm from South Florida, I'm born in the D.C. area. I came in knowing I wanted to do construction, um, was looking at BC and CEM, the two programs within Myers-Lawson. Um, and for me, it made more sense to go into the management side than maybe then the, the design or engineering side. Um, so I made the choice. I never looked back from my freshman year, um, and, and it's been off to the races. Um, as Renee said, BC is a direct admit major, so you will be taking classes from day one that are building construction. Um, we also cross into cl classes with Pamplin. There are plenty of classes that are um, management, business, entrepreneurship. Um, you'll also take uh, some real estate classes as part of that. We also have the double major program, as Renee um, explained. 
that a lot of students do to take um, the, the real estate side of construction and bring it into the building side of construction. Um, and a lot of people go out and do um, real estate development. That's a, it's, a great, it's a great field. Um, some, of, some of the classes, as Renee hit on, um, that integrated series are, are the critical, I guess, secret sauce to BC. Um, it, it really is something that you do not see at other universities that teach construction management. Um, from your second year, you are in um, full-blown groups um, doing real jobs and, and doing bids for projects that are happening in the area. Um, I just finished up 2064 and we did a building out in the VT Corporate Research Park, a rack space project. Um, it is truly real work. You are interfacing with the teams that are actually building the building, learning from the industry professionals that are doing it. Um, everything about building construction is real. Um, there's not a ton of theoretical uh, information. You are learning hands-on with theory, um, and that's one of the reasons I love it. Um, Renee hit on it. Hit Hall is, uh, is uh, the next big step for construction here at Virginia Tech. Um, I don't know where that, that slide went, but... Um, our industry board is behind us a million percent. They raised, I think, $25 million in less than a month um, to, to fund the building, um, and it, it is insane. Uh, the industry board and the career fairs, uh, they simply, you walk into a career fair and you've got people grabbing you by the shoulder and pulling you out of the aisle trying to talk to you. Um, it, as, as aggressive as that may sound, it is great because it is really um, the student's market um, to actually work in this field. You know, there are a lot of preconceptions about construction in the program that, oh, you're a trades worker or something. That's, that while you're managing them and you understand the work you're doing, you're really on the management side of it, project scheduling, budget, safety, cost controls, all that stuff, and executing the work of subcontractors and some companies that do self-perform their own work. Um, in my own um, experience with internships, I worked for two um, general contractors, one called Grunley in D.C., working on an $86 million building for the U.S. State Department. Um, it was a base build building. Um, and then this past summer, I worked with Turner Construction, who's North America's largest general contractor, $14 billion company, doing a $123 million um, airport in South Florida. Um, our students get real experience. Freshmen are trusted and educated to go out in the field after their first year and really help a team on a project. Um, it's absolutely amazing. Um, some of the other great opportunities that Renee hit on um, was, were these uh, construction teams. Um, I was on the ASC team in the fall of last year. You go down to Peachtree, Georgia, it's all paid for, you put up in a hotel, and you basically do a real life proposal, um, and the industry board comes out and sits. Holder Construction, the seventh largest GC in North America, was our judge. They gave us a project they were doing down in Atlanta, um, and we presented it, proposed it, and it was funny, after they showed us their budget, their safety, what they did, um, and, and a lot of stuff aligned, even though we were, we were kids just pitching an idea. Um, we, some, a lot of us had experience, but you know, it doesn't necessarily compare to what the industry is doing. Um, so it was great. It's a great experience. Um, and there's a lot of camaraderie there. One last point I'd like to hit on, um, BC is a family. Um, I know Renee personally. A lot of parents will ask me, um, I'm a building construction ambassador, why I call some of my teachers, professor, and advisors by their first name. It's because we know them on a first name basis. Um, and we can talk to them about anything, um, you know, outside of just academic work, course requests, scheduling. They know you as a person. They care about you. They want to see your success. Professors will clear their entire schedule to talk to you about career advice. They will let you use their office hours or personal time to any questions you really have. Um, one other big thing, our professors, all of them have experience. You know, you've got a lot of academia um, at Virginia Tech, but I think a, a great thing about the department is you've got a great balance of people that are greatly educated but also have great experience, um, and that leads to great students. It's a great program. I'll be in the hallway um, after the presentation. I'd love to discuss with you more. It's definitely not the most traditional engineering path here at Virginia Tech, but it is an absolutely amazing program. Thank you. I'll let Renee hit, go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Thank you, Zach. Okay, in, in closing, uh, actually, Zach hit on it. He's, he said it's a family culture. Uh, and I think the best recommendation you can have is when students go out and tell other students about our major, because a lot of students don't know about us coming into the university. Um, but what's even more special is when students go back into their family and bring their family into the major with them. So since I've been keeping count, we've had seven sets of twins in our major at the same time, and 10 sibling units. The sibling unit that you see here, uh, all four went through the school. Two of them are twins, two of them are not. So that was really exciting when we had all four siblings within the school at the same time. 
We are a BC family. We like to work hard, but we also like to play hard. And we stand out at graduation. So, you know, you'll see us uh, with the hard hats. We have a hard hatting ceremony, which is a, a little more intimate before the actual university ceremony, uh, where we, you know, give the students their hard hats. So please connect with us. We love talking to students. Uh, I will stay after, but also be, feel free to walk over to Bishop Favreau, email us, call us. We're there to talk with you. Thank you so much.